do syringes in the first Ebola outbreak have to do with the loss of faith? Stay tuned to this Virgo Potens production to find out. All of the pictures used in this production are in the public domain. Tainted Syringes and Loss of Faith by Tony Capo Bianco. The world is sick. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews are suffering from terrible illness. Families are frequently torn apart by this vile virus. Priests and bishops are not immune to this plague either. It is truly a global pandemic, perhaps the worst that the world has seen. It's a disease that knows no borders. It has no mercy. The suffering created by this invisible foe is tremendous, and its end, if left untreated, is despair and death. Death and despair on a global level conjures apocalyptic thoughts and images. This despair is compounded by apparent evidence that the purported cure may be contributing to further illness and suffering. What is this plague? Is there a cure? Might the cure be worse than the disease? Are tainted syringes leading to significant sickness? The plague spoken of here is not the virus that has halted the world from 2020 into 2021. This particular plague is a spiritual plague that has been rapidly spreading exponentially around the globe as it cripples and maims all those whom it infects. Has anyone in your family been stricken by the sorrowful loss of faith? Have you seen the despair suffered by those who have lost the faith or those who are seemingly on the verge of losing their faith? The loss of faith is often followed by a loss of hope and love. This foul pestilence is apostasy and the loss of God. Its cure? The return to God. How do we return a lost world to God? We return a lost world to God by inoculating people with all the teachings of Jesus Christ, for it is written in the Gospel of John. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John eight thirty one to 32 Truly, the truth shall set you free. If it were not so, the Son of the living God, he who is truth itself, would not have said that it was so. This teaching is perhaps more relevant now than ever, as we presently live in a world that is inundated with fake news and misinformation. A soul can never truly be happy and at peace unless it is in communion with the omnipotent and loving God that made her. The passing pleasures of this world are but smoke, and when we try to grasp them, we only foolishly grasp at their wispy clouds. This smoke is created by our transient passions, which, when left unmoderated, burn as a fiery furnace consuming desired pleasures. As the fires of desires burn, worldly pleasures are reduced to smoke and ash. Worldly desires are but nothingness. The soul without God is sick, and as she frantically combusts fleeting pleasures in an attempt to self-medicate, she inevitably becomes sicker still, while simultaneously sinking deeper, ever deeper, into nothingness. We, who are blessed by God with receiving and possessing the theological virtue of faith, know and believe that it is only the one true faith that can cure this nefarious plague. All that Jesus Christ taught and commanded us to do and follow is found in the sacred deposit of faith, and the church that he established is charged with guarding and handing down this public revelation to each successive generation. The faithful who make up the mystical body of Christ here in the church militant have a duty of living and sharing the faith. In this way, Christians can be like syringes that deliver the medicine of faith and truth to the infirm. Yet, how can it be that when well-intentioned and often pious Catholics administer the saving vaccine, the results are all too frequently a failure? Indeed, sometimes the application of this medicine appears to compound the sickness of the infirm patient. 
Surely you've seen Catholics quote scripture, doctors of the church, saints, popes, and catechisms to souls outside of the faith to seemingly no avail. If the truth sets us free, then how can this be? How is it that an intellectually, rationally, and theologically sound argument, when spoken with a silver tongue, does not convert souls more frequently? Since the truth does indeed set free, it cannot be the content of the message that is the problem in such cases. It is entirely possible, however, and perhaps even probable, that it is the vessel of the message itself in such cases that is the problem. Instruments and vessels can indeed become tainted. When an instrument becomes contaminated, then it is possible that its contents will likewise become tainted. In the field of medicine, this is, in fact, a real concern and can become a hazard. Nurses of the Yambuku Mission Hospital in Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo, reportedly used five syringes to administer medicine to 300 to 600 patients per day. Along with improper nursing techniques, the reuse of these needles led to contamination. These contaminated syringes were at ground zero of the first known Ebola virus outbreak. This virus may be ancient, but the modern world hadn't encountered it till this devastating outbreak. This first outbreak in 1976 had 318 reported cases of Ebola, along with 280 reported deaths. This means that a staggering 88% of reported cases resulted in death during this disastrous outbreak. Symptoms of Ebola include body aches, diarrhea, fever, and sometimes bleeding inside and outside of the body. Once the person is infected, the virus spreads very rapidly. It mercilessly damages organs and the immune system itself. In the final stage, Ebola can lead to very severe, uncontrollable bleeding and death. Named for the ordinarily life-giving river near where this deadly virus was first discovered, the name Ebola is now synonymous with the stuff of nightmares. The medicine was not what contaminated these poor people. It was the contaminated syringes that spread this deadly outbreak. Clean syringes and instruments are of crucial importance to proper medical care. If this is true in the field of medicine and health care, how much more so is this true in the field of spiritual care and the health of souls? Is not spiritual disease far more dreadful than physical disease? The soul, after all, is eternal, and consequently, a spiritual disease can lead to an eternity spent in hellfire. If we are, as syringes, meant to administer truth and the seeds of faith to the spiritually infirm, what impact will we have if we become tainted? What foul outbreak might we cause if we become contaminated syringes? A dirty needle is not a safe needle. How do Christians become contaminated syringes? It would seem that Christians become contaminated syringes in two main ways. The first way is by ingesting the poison of heresy. If one is tainted by heresy and errors on faith and morals, then he has not the fullness of truth, as taught by Christ. If this be the case, and that person then attempts to deliver truth tainted by heresy to a patient, instead of delivering life-saving medicine, they deliver poison instead. Poison kills the body, and the spiritual poison of heresy poisons the soul, as it rips asunder the soul's relationship with God. In this way, the heresies spread like a vile virus. The second way that a Christian can become a contaminated syringe is through the lack of charity. If you have ever visited the comment sections on videos and on social media, then you can probably think of countless examples of cruel and rash judgments. If we Christians treat each other no different than non-Christians, are we then faithful Christians at all? If we can't or won't be loving to fellow Christians with whom we disagree, how can we ever realistically love our enemies? 
Perhaps if we were to envision that the soul of the person with whom we disagree were hemorrhaging and bleeding out uncontrollably, we might then be more patient and charitable towards them. Spiritual suffering and sickness is just as real as its physical counterparts, even though it is often as invisible as mental illness. We never truly know what another person is dealing with, and it would be wise to always keep this in mind. How is it that charity has grown cold? The key to understanding how this could be may be found in our blessed Lord's words, which were quoted earlier, namely, If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed. Therefore, if we do not continue in the Lord's word, then we shall not indeed be his disciples. If we do not follow the exemplary example of the Lord Jesus, then people will not see Jesus when they look upon us. The Lord Jesus did everything in, with, and for love. Yes, he ate and drank with sinners to call them to repentance and to follow him, but he did so gently, tenderly, and with the greatest love. He who is God humbled himself and never came across as pretentious. Jesus, the Son of God and the second person of the most blessed Trinity, could have righteously spoken in a condescending manner, because he is omniscient and omnipotent. Did he speak or behave so? No, he did not. How much more must we, mere creatures, be careful to resist temptations towards pride? If our speech is condescending, are we imitating and following the Lord, or are we following the devil? The Lord was never bitter even when sinful men spat upon him, scourged him, and put him to death on the cross. How can we, who are far less than the Master, claim to follow him if we behave bitterly and angrily in contradiction to the way set before us by Christ? When people ask sincere questions, we must not lose patience or snap at them in response. We must recognize that Jesus has been merciful and patient with us, even though we are great sinners, and as such we are obliged to act in kind with our family, neighbors, friends, and even our enemies. Perhaps you might feel like the Lord hasn't been particularly merciful to you. If so, call to mind the divine mercy found in the sacraments of baptism and confession. After having made a sincere confession, has the Lord ever denied you absolution? If you feel abandoned, think about the Lord's agony in the garden. Also, contemplate how our Eucharistic Lord humbly comes to us in the most holy Eucharist. If we beat people over the head with the Catechism or with the Holy Bible itself, it won't change their hearts and minds. Acting with kindness, meekness, gentleness, patience, authentic joy, while exhibiting rightly ordered virtuous lives of love will change hearts and minds in a supernatural way, because when we do so, the Holy Spirit can work through us. Drive-by scripture shouting almost certainly won't hit the mark with the intended result. Do you think that constant bickering about the leadership of certain priests, bishops, and popes is bringing souls into the church? Is this bickering bringing souls already within the church closer to Christ while cultivating a greater love for Holy Mother Church? If people constantly hear about scandals from us, and if they perceive that we are perpetually angry and judgmental, why on earth would they want to join us? The spirit of the world already offers anger, but the spirit of the world cannot offer the peace of Christ. We, as Catholics, need to do some soul-searching and remember who we are. The average person isn't interested in theological or liturgical debates. People are more likely to be interested in the meaning of life, beauty, and the rich mysteries of faith. Much of the church militant here on earth is infirm. Fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters are suffering. Real people who were created in the image of God are suffering. Our local communities are suffering. The world is suffering. It's time to get over ourselves. Jesus Christ gave us the cure to inoculate the infirm. The cure is the holy Catholic faith. 
if we are guilty of driving people away from Christ and his church, if we are guilty of infecting people with a harmful spiritual disease, if we are guilty of speaking the truth without charity, then we need to repent, get to confession, and follow the Lord. Each of us ought to ask ourselves, Have I become a contaminated syringe? The Catholic faith is the cure for the apocalyptic plague of apostasy and the loss of God. This cure is not deficient. It is we who are deficient and unworthy. If the inoculation against the disease seems to be compounding the disease, it is because we have become tainted syringes. Purify the syringes and purify the world. This supernatural medicine works. It is crucial to protect ourselves from the disease of heresy and from permitting our charity to grow cold. Charity is vital. People are attracted to love and beauty. Meditating on the life of Christ will reveal to us how perfectly he loved and how we had ought to love. I am a sinner, but I strongly desire to follow Christ in a manner that is pleasing in his sight. If we are to be true followers of the Lord Jesus, then we must follow his word. Sacred scripture tells us that if we have not charity, then we have nothing. Finally, St. Paul puts it like this. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy and should know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is patient, is kind. Charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth with the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never falleth away, whether prophecy shall be made void, or tongue shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the things of a child. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Now I know part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now there remain faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, I invite you to visit the Virgo Potens website at virgopotens.org. Virgo Potens has articles, traditional Latin Mass resources, transcribed sermons, prayers in English and Latin, narrated videos of the Dolorous Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, and a spiritual warfare page. I offer the content on the website and YouTube channel for free, but this work is a full-time apostolate, and your support is needed. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by praying for me, becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon, and or by purchasing one of my eBooks. If you'd prefer to give me a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by buying one of my eBooks. Links to my eBooks as well as to Patreon can be found at virgopotens.org. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Thank <laughs> you.